All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll try to wrap it this like very quickly because we are obviously running out of time. So uh, hello, my name is Mati. I work for Vaden as a developer advocate, and uh, yeah, so Vaden uh, is my employer. It, we are based in Finland, and today I'm gonna talk about uh, some design thinking that we are doing and applying at Vaden uh, for increasing the reach and the interactivity of our uh, uh, components. So uh, what I'm gonna do is basically giving you three examples out of the box and uh, we can discuss them. So the first example is when Android devices gets announced generally. And here I don't uh, mean a specific company, I mean in general. Uh, whenever a new uh, Android device with huge uh, specifications, technical specifications, and all these kind of things gets announced, uh, we then find that it doesn't get the amount of popularity as much as iPhone. And it always wonder, uh, it's always a wonder why, why iPhone gets more popularity and more market. Uh, if, if from technical point of view, we compare between an Android device and an iPhone, then this is the best way to describe an iPhone from technical point of view. And regardless of whether you are an open source and you like technology and privacy and security and all these kind of things, if we take a random person in the street outside of this room, and we give this person $1,000. Uh, and we tell them that this money can be used to uh, buy a new mobile device. Which mobile device you think this person is going to buy? Statistically, most likely they're going to buy an iPhone. And the reason behind that, of course, marketing and all these kind of things, but also because users don't care. So yeah, we are in an open source conference, and we talk about open source, but users don't care. You, you cannot like pitch to users that uh, my software is best because it's an open source and you cannot pitch because it's like secure or like it uses specific technology and these kind of things. So this is the design thinking number one. You need to choose technical specification versus usability. If it just work, if it's just intuitive enough and if it's just like easy to use right away, then users will use it. Um, and well, in an ideal situation, if you can combine both usability and open source and security, then you are probably on uh, the ultimate best. The second example I have for you today is Amazon. So uh, again, because we are technical people, most of us uh, think about Amazon as data center, servers, backend computing, and stuff like that. But again, for people in the street, uh, probably Amazon for them is a way to shipping, ship devices and uh, like for, for uh, online shopping, right? Uh, if we pick a bigger audience, like for example, many places in Europe or Africa, for example, or many places in Asia, for them, Amazon actually is a cool place in Brazil. So uh, this is just one word, like how the word is translated in many uh, concepts or many perspectives. And this is also uh, an important thing when you are developing a new solution. You need to think what is your target audience. We at Vaden, we are uh, targeting developers. So we are targeting this portion of internet users. Don't do like us. Try to target the blue portion. So uh, if, if, you are, if you want to target the greater audience, African people, Asian people, well, we are in Asia, right? So European people, American people, and everyone in the world is completely different design perspective than targeting only developers. And again, this is related to also mentioning the kind of technology and the kind of open sourceness that you have in your uh, design. Uh, mentioning that for the user, they don't care. So this is a note number two. Uh, using familiar tools that you are familiar with versus targeting specific users. So mentioning, for example, that you are using native C++ code or mentioning that you are using very complex assembly optimized code doesn't help the user. What helps the user is basically the final output. The third example that I'm going to go over it very quickly is Twitter. So uh, anyone can spot, the, oh, we have four Twitters now, but there are only two, okay? So can anyone spot the difference between uh, those two Twitter, like one big highlight? Sorry? One's in French. Uh, both of them are in French, isn't it? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, they are, they are different in the language. But there is one more difference. 
Sorry? The what? Okay, that's a good good observation. Uh, actually, uh, the biggest difference between bo so both of those are taken from my Android device, and the big difference uh, between them is that uh, one of them is a progressive web app, and the second one is actually a native app. And this is actually what I want to uh, highlight. So if if we go quickly uh, uh, and make a comparison between uh, the native app, which is this one then uh, we're going to see that to get the native app, you need to download some 25 megabytes. Uh, it's going to ask you permissions like uh, access the notification, access the camera, and so on. Um, and if, if it happens that it's your first time ever to download the Twitter app or it's a new device, then you will not get the features of autofill and automatically remembering your data and so on. And uh, it, it's going to also not remember across other apps. So if it happened that, again, this is a new device and you are installing for the first time, and then you download another app like Facebook or Google Plus or something like that, then it will not remember your data and you need to refill it again. And uh, whenever there is an update, you need to re-download a lot bunch of new uh, data and so on. And the cost of development from technical point of view, the cost of developing this is quite expensive because you need to manage multiple platforms, multiple different devices and so on versus the second one which is basically exactly the same i didn't modify the picture or anything this is a progressive web app running from the web directly uh, to load it for the first time it took me uh, almost uh, half kilo or quarter kilobyte uh, quarter megabyte it doesn't ask for permission it progressively asks for permission so at this point it didn't ask for anything but when i try to access a the camera then it's going to tell me hey can i take permission to take your camera or your location and so on uh, because it's a browser based so autofill is out of the box as well as everything that i enter here is well remembered across other apps and i'm guaranteed to always have the latest version every time i open this app I'm guaranteed to be uh, given the latest version. And here we're talking about the platform. So we develop only once on one platform, and then it's available everywhere. So uh, this is a huge difference. Now, when I tell you again 24 megabyte or 25 megabyte, maybe you feel like it's a small number. What is this number? Actually, uh, let, let, let's put it in this context. Would you wait for a website to uh, load after 25 megabyte? Like you have to wait for 25 megabytes for the homepage of a website to load? Uh, probably you will not. So uh, this is a huge difference between a progressive web app and a native app. And from a user perspective, if you, you are a big fan of developing natively and developing on a native context, do your user really care? Of course, if you're targeting developers, then mentioning that I developed this app with Objective-C or with Kotlin, maybe you will get more attention. But most likely, most users don't really care. Remember, your user just wants some things that just work. They probably don't care about what kind of processor, what is the RAM capacity, what kind of things, all those kind of things. Now, what is the big idea about Progressive Web App? Uh, this is a kind, kind of modified uh, uh, joke taken from the internet uh, asking about what kind of uh, pre-installed app that we can have on the mobile device when you buy a new device why do I have to install all the apps and the answer is internet isn't it so uh, we have seen this happening recently we have seen that cloud took over we have seen that mobile also is taking over we have seen that uh, people are moving away from uh, normal executable files exe file to the browser and then we have seen people moving from desktop usage to the mobile and here I'm not talking about developers again I'm talking about users we are we are seeing clearly that uh, the majority of traffic is coming from uh, mobile or or tablet based devices so um, so the important uh, the, the important note that we uh, need to take, take care here is that is it, is it really worth it to uh, advertise about your fancy technology or is it worth it to care about user experience? 
And luckily, there is a term for that. It's called Progressive Web App. I mentioned it pr uh, briefly earlier, but um, basically, the, the first person that announced about this name or came up with this ac acronym uh, was from Google. And now all the big companies and all the big players in the market are adopting this. Uh, as I showed you, Twitter now has a version of Progressive Web App. So I don't have to install Twitter anymore on my mobile device. I can just use the Progressive Web App version. And it's coming to other platforms, news websites, and so on. And there is a huge support from it, even from Apple. So if you're on the beta version, you're going to see support for it. So what is Progressive Web App? Progressive Web App is not a new framework. It's not uh, a new programming language or anything like that. It's just design specifications that you need to add to your application, web application, to make it progressive. And it comes from the, the name itself, progressively understanding the user, and eventually make it fast, feels native, and so on. And my uh, highlight today is the offline first design part. So uh, making it also work offline. So I, I want to take this uh, Twitter application that I just showed to you, and I want to fly and still be able to use it. Of course, it doesn't make sense, right? Because tweets is about lifetime. Sometimes it makes sense if you want to see recent tweets, recent messages, respond to recent messages, respond to them, and then it sync back when you connect to the internet. So two topics today, offline first design and how is that uh, related to web components or how we are doing it with web components. I'm going to go very, very quick over this. So web components, have you heard about web components before? Two, three. OK, so uh, actually web component is a standard. Uh, there is a huge reading about it, like what is the standard specification, how to follow it, and so on. But I like to summarize it in this picture. So uh, this is actually a video. Uh, it was played on Facebook page. And uh, we see that if we inspect, inspect it, it's actually a video tag. It's not a Flash plugin or anything like that. And when HTML5 appeared, <coughs> When HTML5 appeared, it made this possible, and we have seen that video tag can be used. But uh, the fact is, it's not actually like one big tag that produce a video player. It consists of something called shadow DOM that consists of divs and spans and uh, a lot of things. So basically, it's kind of encapsulation or it, like object-oriented concept inside the browser that we see inside the video tag. And luckily, now the standard make it possible for developers to produce web components. So having uh, the power of some, some stuff related to uh, object-oriented programming available inside the HTML DOM. And here I, I would love to uh, share a small experience that we had at Valen, uh, comparing what we had in our framework before using web component and after using web component. So in Vaden framework, uh, before using web components, we used to have a set of UI components, but they only work with Vaden framework because they are designed for the Vaden framework. And if you are using the framework and you want to extend it with other add-ons, then you need to go to the directory and see the contributions. They are all open source, of course, but still limited to only this add-on. And uh, it's a bit challenging because you need to be expert in this field to be able to modify those add-ons and so on. But after using Web Component, now the whole concept is changing because it's standard. And when we say it's standard, it means that it's interchangeable. We can use basically pretty much any Web Component. It can be used with the framework. And at the same time, if somebody design a UI component for our framework, then it can be used elsewhere as well. So um, yeah, that was uh, like uh, a quick comparison between before and after uh, web components. And what is the benefit? So only in two years, um, in the directory, there is approximately uh, 1,300 or a little bit less than 1,300 uh, open source, freely available web component that not just work with our framework, but can also work with pretty much any modern framework, such as Angular, uh, React, and so on and so forth. It's a big deal, isn't it? The second uh, concept I have for you today is the offline first design and how we actually can perform it. So uh, offline first is my favorite because it's the only way to guarantee 
100% always on user experience. And it's my favorite because uh, this is really what matter from user experience point of view. So, uh, so this is all what I was advocating about from the first because we need a better design. We need to reach better user experience. So uh, having an uninterrupted experience and having the user still using the app while moving around is how to reach your user better. So how to do that? Uh, there are a lot of ideas, like for example, caching. So it's a website. We can just cache it, and that's it. Uh, but the challenge with caching is that it doesn't work with dynamic web applications. So caching can be perfect for a static web page and so on. But let's take a very small example, like a contact application. So I have a list of contacts. And then when I click on a contact, it should display a form displaying my picture and email address, first name, last name, and so on. So this is not going to work because, uh, because it's it, it requires some kind of dynamic data changes. Luckily, there is offline storage inside the browser. Uh, it, it's perfect. There is a lot of uh, nice frameworks that do that as well. Uh, the down or, or the limitation here is that it's one-way storage. So you take the data from your database and store it inside the browser. Now, what if the user modified the data offline? How can you synchronize this data back to the server? Of course, you can write your own solution, but uh, the data replication part is uh, 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 there are a lot of attempts that are trying to help those. And uh, today, um, I'm going to highlight two solutions. The first one is Firebase. And Firebase is, well, Firebase used to be an independent solution before it got acquired by Google. Uh, it was excellent in doing this out of the box and works on uh, mobile devices as well as web applications. Uh, but now you have to understand that it's owned by Google. So the servers are owned by Google, and you have to pay Google, and you have to store everything on Google. So it's up to you. You decide. Uh, but the other solution that I love so much is PouchDB. So PouchDB is an Apache 2.0 solution available freely open source. You can see from the GitHub that they are very active. And uh, this is my favorite solution uh, up till now. Of course, there are other solutions. But uh, to, to j just summarize how the solution works, basically, uh, you implement your application in this way. First of all, this is your client side, and this is your server side. Now, instead of making a direct communication between your client side and the server side, you make it work with PouchDB. And PouchDB is going to make automatically bidirectional replication with the server. So instead of communicating with the server, it's going to do that out of the box for you. So now what will happen if you lost connection? No worries, because your client side still works with PowerDB. So from your client side implementation, nothing going hap to happen. And PowerDB is going to take care of managing the data offline and synchronizing it back to the server. I have also a demo for you that is showing you how uh, this basically can be done. Um, this is a screenshot of early phase of the demo. And just to give you an idea, I'm going to show you uh, the final version. So if you go to my GitHub, you've, you're going to find it here, offline first app. Uh, the good part about it, so this is a final version after a lot of modifications and a lot of uh, improvement. And the best part, this is also on how it looked like on mobile device. Uh, there are steps showing you step by step how I migrated from a normal application, just started a very normal application, HTML based, and migrated it to be an offline first application. The whole idea is simple, just breaking the connection that is happening from your client side to the server to be going to the PouchDB. And then implement a CouchDB layer on top of your backend server. So if you are interested, uh, please do follow this project or contribute if you are interested. Uh, this is a continuous project that I'm continuously uh, trying to improve and show how it can be done. Uh, but uh, if 
if you are really into this, I'm also uh, trying to do it with other languages like Angular, Polymer, and uh, yeah, I have done it also in React, but it's not here. You can see it in my repositories because it's not like really ready yet. But the idea is simple. I'm trying to use web components and I'm trying to make them work offline in an application. Now, This is a link for the applications that I just show it to you now. And finally, the challenges. So what are the challenges with this concept? Uh, the first challenge is uh, the initial load of the data. So uh, you would expect that uh, if you are connecting this with a database and then you're, you have a big database, like one terabyte of data or something like that, you don't want your user to wait till one terabyte of data gets downloaded on his device assuming that he has one terabyte of available storage. So uh, this is something that you need to really architect from the day one to know how to uh, take a snapshot and very specified snapshot for this user to be downloaded. The second uh, challenge is the security of stored data. So now you are exposing a database level data and store it inside the browser. And this needs to be really taken care of in terms of authentication, wiping the data if you log out and so on. And finally, the race condition, which is something that will happen in real application. The only problem here is that it might happen more often, that I modify the data offline, multiple users modify the data offline, and then when we connect back online, we're going to have the race condition. Luckily, there is a solution for that. PouchDB provides something called best guess merge. But if you don't like that, you can fall back into, for example, asking the user, OK, the data got modified when you were offline, and I cannot save the data. What to do? So ask the user what to do, or just implement your measuring strategy. But this is something that you're going to face even, even if you are implementing an online application. Just it happens more often. Now, um, well, uh, I had some uh, talk about uh, also comparison before web component, but I can uh, basically uh, summarize it here. So we had um, a small article talking about how to, uh, how to do that uh, in Java, but after uh, using web component, I figured out that it's a little bit tricky to do it uh, the standard way. Uh, luckily, uh, we have improved uh, and, and shown a standard way of including web components inside a Java application if you are into the Java part. Last thing I have, well, I'm running out of time, but last thing I have. Yeah, um, sure we got about a minute. So okay. And then so. Okay, right. So the final thing I have for you today is a practical test. I'm all the way talking about design, so I'm also telling you how to test that your application is best uh, suit suitable for uh, design thinking. Uh, the first thing is uh, make sure that it's mobile first design. And by mobile first design, I mean that when you are testing your application, test on mobile device. Don't test on desktop. Don't test on an emulated desktop. Don't test on an emulated browser. Just test on device. That's the real meaning of mobile first design. If it works on mobile, then eventually, out of the box, it's going to work on desktop. The second thing is uh, touch first design which is also think that your user doesn't have a cursor. So they cannot reach the small icon on the top left corner. They cannot reach uh, if there are two links or a drop down menu or something like that. They cannot click on it. So make sure that the user has a big fat thump when they are clicking and navigating around your application. The final uh, practical test is coffee first design. I made up this one, which is basically give your tester a cup of coffee and a mobile device on the other side and see if your user will be able to navigate across the application and do everything without splitting the coffee on top of his device. So if he can manage to do all of that with one hand, then you are on the good side. If you are not really with the coffee design, then maybe you can take the drive design. So make him drive a car <laughs> and see if he can crash. So uh, that was everything. This is, again, the link for the GitHub. Please do uh, follow it if you're interested. Uh, another article I have for you related to Java with progressive web apps. Other than that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have questions, yeah. do you have questions? Yes, so before I take questions, uh, 
Kokoi and Fatima Rafiki, uh, if you are in the room, please step forward. Please step forward. Stand.